two being Jax and um, Numpyro. So uh, I'll give a, like a little bit of um, a, a tiny bit of a quick explanation about sort of where Jax fits into the ecosystem of uh, deep learning tools. So there's the two kind of behemoths in the space, which would be um, TensorFlow and uh, NumPy, uh, sorry, um, uh, PyTorch. And um, compared to them, Jax is uh, relatively very new and does things um, kind of a different way to the other tools. And um, there's this kind of, uh, there's this funny thing where the major thing that Jax did was allow you to use a NumPy style API. So you could just do the things as you would normally do in NumPy and then have it compiled for um, CPU, parallel or GPU. Uh, recently, I think I've seen TensorFlow is now adding in its experimental section, a NumPy compatible API. So I think one, one thing you do see is when these um, minor frameworks kind of create new and interesting features, sometimes the major frameworks will like, will, will grab them. Um, cool, excellent. So um, I'm, I'm gonna have to switch back and forth to check if there are any questions in chat. So um, every so often I'll we'll just come back. So if you ask a question, just, uh, just be a little bit patient. So um, the next, the other library I'm gonna be talking about is NumPyro. And so this is a library that uh, basically allows you to do um, uh, advanced Bayesian inference using Python and Jax. One of the things is that the uh, sort of together Jax and NumPyro is an excellent combination because you can start doing really interesting things like inference and sampling over things which are really just very native, natural looking Python functions. And we'll kind of see as we go on. So the two important things to note here though, is that I'm not importing NumPy as NP. NP here is the Jax version of NumPy. It's Jax.NumPy, not the sort of classic NumPy. And the other thing to see is that we're importing um, a few things from NumPyro. So um, then, uh, interestingly, you can actually use NumPy at the same time as the Jax version of NumPy. They have the same API, but there's no reason you can't use them together. So um, here, um, the full NumPy word is the NumPy classic, so to speak. And we're going to show you a little bit of how they can sometimes interoperate. And then we've got some, some other stuff. So uh, this is uh, a classic data set from kind of Bayesian statistics we're going to use. And this is actually going to be a little bit of a fresh, a fresh take on it. But this is um, recorded coal mining disasters in the UK. And this is kind of like a change point problem. So we can kind of see that it does seem like the number of disasters per year between 1860 and 1960 has decreased. Um, there was a change in the law at some point, and so we kind of want to build a statistical model which will answer the questions of, was there really a change, and if so, when did it happen, and how rapid was that change? Now, um, change point models are something that are interesting on their own, but uh, one of the reasons why uh, we, we, we do this this way is because um, Andrew Gelman has this idea is that when you're looking for any sort of change point per se, what you're really looking for is something changing over time. And one perfect way to look at that is a simply uh, a function to, to view, for example, like rate, like the rate of disasters as a function of time. So if we um, sort of scroll down a little bit here, I've got a definition for a generalized sigmoid. So um, you probably know and love the sigmoid, uh, you know, zero at zero, uh, asymptotes to one kind of on the right hand side pretty quickly and to um, negative one or zero on the left hand side. Um, in this case, what I've done is I've added some more parameters. So essentially we have um, a parameter which says where is our, where is our top value, where is our bottom value, and uh, where is our change. This is a classic sigmoid. This is the, the, the parameters for classic sigmoid. But here's, for example, one that starts at two, ends at four. So we've got A is two, K is four. And then we've got when does it actually, where is the midpoint? Um, and so that's at 
50, whatever that is. And then we've got this B parameter and B is how sharp the transition is. So you can th kind of think of this sigmoid as, I mean, it is just a sigmoid, but it's one that's spe uh, specially parameterized. So we can drag around the top, we can drag around the change point and we can make the change more or less uh, abrupt, which is exactly what we want for sort of trying to model the rate here. So what we're trying to do is say, well, you know, basically we would like to put an S curve over this noisy data, but with the level of uncertainty taken into account. So um, here is the actual um, JAX model, uh, sorry, the numpyro slash JAX model itself. And there's some interesting things to note here. So this is probabilistic programming. If you haven't seen it before, you're not a Bayesian, it's going to be uh, a little bit rough, but I'll just draw your attention to some key elements. So one is that uh, we have this thing which looks like a variable. It's saying, this is my, for example, early rate. This is my late rate, which is the rate of mining disasters. This is the um, uh, rate sort of scale. And this is the, the sort of change point. Uh, so I'm kind of assigning these, even though these are unknowns that I'm trying to do inference over, I'm kind of assigning these to um, variables as if they were real values. Secondly, there's this gen sigmoid function here. And now clearly uh, gen sigmoid, there is nothing special about it. It's just a regular looking Python function. And in fact, just using it like this, I could you know, call it, plot it, do all the things I would normally want to do with it. And so one of the things that's really interesting, and this is the kind of power and in some sense, ass backwardsness of Bayesian programming is that I'm using a function here just as I would, but, and I'm putting inputs into it, but I don't actually know what they are. I'm essentially saying these things I would like to know. I would like to know the values I need to put into this function to get my correct rate. So instead of in normal programming, you have a fixed value in a variable and then you go forward with it, where essentially going backwards to what would have gone into this function to get the evidence that I see. And so the evidence itself is in this final line where we're essentially saying um, for some rate T, which is the uh, rate in a given year, I will observe D, which is our data, and it will come from a Poisson distribution. So it's essentially saying that um, the, the rate of um, mining disasters will say, as an example, in 1860, be four mining disasters per year. And I'm not gonna get exactly four per year. I'm gonna get some sort of noisy spread and the sort of width and um, distribution of that spread will be Poisson. So you can kind of think of it as this sigmoid here, this S curve, we're gonna try and overlay it here with the noise and the position of the S curve is not gonna be where the dot is. The position of the S curve is where the average rate is. And we don't observe the average rate, we only deserve how many actually happened. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of what's so beautiful about this is it's got some interesting things we're going backwards in a way, not forwards, but we're going backwards with what are really pretty nice normal functions. And if we were to write this out, this would be a very textbook kind of probability model. And I'm gonna check if we have any questions. Um, so Jacob asks, so each variable is some distribution of some shape. Yeah, almost, almost every variable. So in this case, these four are distributions of some shape. Um, essentially. Uh, but what's interesting is that NumPyro was actually going to sort of, in a way, compile this into a sampling system so that when Gen Sigmoid gets this value, it won't have the whole distribution. It will have essentially a sample of that distribution. NumPyro.deterministic is in, it's, it's a distribution in the sense of like a Dirac Delta distribution but it's basically saying that um, this is calculated in a deterministic way from these values. It's not, it's not a random variable sort of um, uh, really, but we do want to record it. And we, so when we sample it, um, is there any, any other questions on this? So the task is a best fit across parameters. Um, we could search for a best fit. The kind of Bayesian approach as we'll see later is to instead get the uh, all plausible hypotheses weighted by how much they, they match the evidence. 
And I think the, the next section will dovetail into that nicely. See how I'm going for time. Okay, so here we can see our um, actual sampling itself. And I think I can run this, yes. So what this is doing is now compiling the model and sampling. So I'm going to get, in this case, I think 5,000 um, or 4,000 samples, which are essentially um, in, the, um, in the, the approach we're using are a possible set of parameters for this sigmoid, which fit well with the evidence. And so here we, we can have a nice textual summary. So um, our early rate is around 3.3 um, disasters per year and our late rate is sort of on average, the, the mean of our posterior is, um, is uh, 0.8 of a disaster. But we also get some nice stats here. So we can see we get a, we get a median and we get some uh, percentiles. So we're essentially saying there is a 95% uh, chance that it's between, that the late rate is between uh, 0.6 disasters per year and, um, and one disaster per year. So we don't actually have enough evidence to, to rule out there being, say, larger, larger numbers of disasters in the, in the late. Um, and we also have the, the actual change point itself. So um, I will skip some stuff about RVIS, but just to tell you that there are some great tools for visualizing these posteriors. And I'm just going to skip around a bit but here we can see the actual posterior distributions for the parameters we've found. And actually, you know what, I'll skip forward again to, here's, here's the kind of classic Bayesian um, sort of ideal. We can see each gray line is one possible sort of function of time for the rate of mining disasters. And you can see this is, in fact, a hundred of them overlaid in this kind of ghostly fashion. Um, and you can see that, for example, in these years where we have a little bit less data and also more noise because of the higher rate, the exact position of the sigmoid is uh, significantly more uncertain, but they all seem to support a change around kind of 1880 to 1900. And in fact, we can do that in a separate way, which is the other classic Bayesian way of doing it, which is the sort of sausage graph, which is in some sense, this kind of like orange shaded region should contain 95 or 99% of these hypotheses, depending on how you want to plot it. I think this one is 95. So 95 of kind of all these lines, 95% of all these lines will fall in this orange shaded region. So we can kind of think of it as this is a, pr we're pretty certain that the rate of mining accidents is in this orange band. Um, we can then also ask some pretty um, specific questions, like for example, where's the mean change point, which is here 1888. And um, that's very lucky and totally, totally accidental. And we can also ask some other interesting questions, like what's the difference between the, on average, what was the difference between the late rate and the early rate. So here it's a reduction of 2.4 mining disasters per year. And we can also, with samples, ask some, some questions which are difficult with other probability models. So for example, we can ask, what's the probability that the change was between 1890 and 1900? In this case, it's a 30% 30, 30 chance. Um, this is one way to look at the parameters and it's the most um, intuitive, but we could also look at them as these kind of density plots. So here you can see early rate has kind of um, uh, lumped around 3.2 to 3.4. So this is the pre-change rate, 3.2 to 3.4 sort of disasters per year. And the late rate is kind of, you know, you can see that we're pretty sure it's around 0.7 to 1.1 per year. But again, we're not certain. And this is one of the beautiful things about sort of Bayesian modeling overall is that you get a fairly principled, well, actually one would say very principled way to see the uncertainty that the noise has sort of caused this reverse process. So to summarize, uh, I'll just actually jump to questions. Um, Chris, is this something you could do in Stan if Stan had GPU superpowers? Uh, yeah, excellent question. So um, yes, you could absolutely put this exact model into Stan and it would be very, very similar. Um, one of the reasons to use um, NumPy or JAX over Stan would be that uh, it has GPU, power, GPU superpowers today 
and also um, it's very nicely integrated into Python. Uh, oh, so where did you use Jack? So where did we use Jax? Yeah, that's um, a really good, it's very subtle actually because of how, um, lost my window, because of how uh, simple it really is. Notice here, I'm not using NumPy, I'm using Jax NumPy. And here I'm calling np.exp. And also because this is like a Jax NumPy object, plus is overloaded. So that's actually the Jax like vectorized plus. This is a vectorized divide, et cetera, et cetera. So this function here is where the Jax actually happens. And this is one of the things that I really like about Jax is very, very unintrusive. It feels incredibly lightweight and easy to use as opposed to having to do a huge amount of rigmarole and setup that's sometimes required with the more sort of heavyweight deep learning tools, which isn't to say that that's not useful or good. It's just that if, especially for doing things like this, it's very, very lightweight and unintrusive. And, and this is sort of very easy to think about and read and test and debug, and it feels very streamlined. So that's what I would say. The, the sort of the statistical, especially Bayesian statistical analysis um, experience of this probabilistic programming approach plus JAX plus NumPyro is very, very kind of uh, intuitive, low friction and well integrated. And um, I think I've already gone over time a little bit. Um, here we go. One last, qu one last question. From my experience, the issue with these models is that it gets out of hand fast if you have more variables in terms of runtime and stability. Do you have any examples of where use this with a more complex data set? Yeah, uh, excellent question, um, Valentin. This is, this could be, that could be like a whole talk on its own. Um, you can do extraordinarily large models. I mean, people do Bayesian inference over large CNNs now, even very large modern CNNs. Uh, there are also approximations you can use. There's an entire area of things like um, AVDI, um, variational Bayesian inference, in general, there's a huge, huge field where you, where you use certain approximations which can um, um, allow you to do these things at a much larger scale. I think scaling Bayesianism in general is a huge and interesting area. But what I will say is um, if the number of variables per se isn't the only problem. Like I regularly fit models with many thousands of degrees of freedom with not a huge amount of problem, but they have to be um, with a, without significant problems, but they have to be designed sort of carefully from the start al along some principles with some intuition. And I, I mean, if you would all be interested, I could do a talk sort of on that, but this is just meant to be a taster. Okay, um, I think that was where I will include it and I will um, stop sharing and hand over to you, Matt.